I've been writing ekphrastic poems. Do you know what ekphrastic poems are? Ekphrastic poems are poems that um, are inspired by the visual arts. Um, and so I'm going to read a, a few newer poems uh, to start the reading that are ekphrastic poems. Um, I've been, my, my, my chief concerns of late are the no negotiation between the grotesque and the graceful. And trying to find the place in between where the graceful can be elucidated from the grotesque. And I kind of want to give you a, a, a little bit of a warning because some of the images are surprising and shocking. This is a portrait by the painter Mihaly de Moncasey, and it's entitled Study for the Death of Mozart. Study for the Death of Mozart. The jonquils are under a blanket of snow, and the residue from the open windows occludes the mirror at the foot of the bed. The space between the flowers' heads in the rows along the house, the silence at the end of the loudest waltz. Not one window renounces its light. The house from the road would seem to be on fire from all the burning wicks. Down the frozen stepping stones, a nurse descends with a bucket for water, the handle vanishing under the banks, while the wind gusts inflate her hood like a swollen cord. The terraces of the winter garden are pocked with animal tracks. Deer clatter past the scene. They pick through the crusted ice at the flower beds, and Mozart watches from his bed, matching his breath with their animal wills. The maids have wrapped themselves in the drapery, and their vowels are visible owls in the spaces before their lips. Fever makes its own temple, and the notes of its song streak the scene like jagged corners of silver trays. The requiem will be an ellipsis as his pen floats in his bloated fingers. Sophie is massaging his feet, which look like rosettes in her hands. There is a song impossibly in his head. The thought he'd been poisoned breathes its tambourine with a sudden flick of a wrist. Pine trees sway as if to argue with him, and the fire in the stove ripples its muscular tongue. The papers in Mozart's lap are littered with marks like impatient berries, and the candle flame at his bedside hurdles its ethereal body into the feathered dark. Outside, the nurse stumbles with her bucket, heavy with snow. Deer flee her gate, while the ice's solid oratory will not break until March. This is an image by Edward Muybridge. Edward Muybridge was uh, sort of a, a, a photographer who was the precursor of cinematography. And he was very famous for these sequences of photos that depict animal motion. Uh, the title of this piece is Boy, Child Without Legs Getting Off a Chair, and it's also the title of the poem. Boy, Child Without Legs getting off a chair. The boy raises himself up by his arms and follows a sequence of intentions, thrusts his hips out. In this action, he is no longer a boy, but a bell. The clapper, the weight of his leg stumps. He rocks himself and sets his body down on his haunches then draws his arms slightly up and forward again, palms against the wooden studio floor. Perhaps he feels the grit of sand between his fingers or the lacquer blackening his nails. 
Regardless, the intent to move is paramount because the line between frames demands consecutive action. Air on the bare and rounded ends of his legs shears the speed of his movement. His bell peals its silent toll, rings a sound which is not a sound, but a heft, a series of sways this way and that. His legs slow the swing of this pendular body to a wild suspension, aloft as the camera demands. Palms against the floor as his trunk again thrusts forward into the darkened wood. He sails again aloft to mount the chair. The boy moves forward, keeps his distance from the chair at arm's length. He turns and raises his body up with one hand on the ground, one on the chair, his absent legs high in the air as if twirling a cartwheel. The boy slowly wheels into the seat of the chair and slowly as if his body is the lip of a bell done ringing its one song returns downward through the will of gravity. And still the camera snaps while the chair has no intention or sequence. It is idle and it is where the boy sits, turns to the camera and smiles. The shadows carve his muscled torso as he contorts, as he turns himself again, both arms pressed to the floor and he lowers his haunches down. Perhaps the black of the lens snaps its slow frame audibly to usher the time, to urge the dismount from the chair. And so the boy listens to his own peal, the sound of his heart thickened by the stress of such simple gestures. The reel clicks its repetitions while the breath of the man behind the camera syncopates with the boy's own swaying legs. In this frame, he is sitting still. In this frame, he flies. This is an image by Rosamond Purcell. It's entitled um, 47 Needles. And you don't see all 47 because you, you got to turn the glass around. And um, the thing about these needles, they were ingested uh, by a woman who was a hysteric. Um, so these were all extracted from a body. Nocturne with needles pinned in beautiful rows. These are really dark poems, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll mellow out, I'll, ch I'll, chill, I'll, chill your, I'll chill the mood out. Nocturne with needles pinned in beautiful rows. Because the night is arrayed in linear teeth and because the only great things we leave to gods are the enormities of our suffering. Therefore, row after row of needles arranged in their stiff celebratory lines, the sheen of them dizzy in the museum light, their casings streaked with bits of rust as though the blood from madness's veins hardened into a thin cake instantaneously. How they must have throttled her, kept the river of her arteries edged with snow, the rattle trap heart of her beating its slower and slower cycles as needle pricks skin and plunger dips down into that thing deeper than memory, rimmed with ice as green as arctic depths. Therefore, the sejura, her breath lapses and jumps, cleaved as one apocalypse into another. Then bewilderment, as the city lights bleed into its own intoxicated celebrity, the skyline sudden from this vantage point, having fallen on her back in the park. The air's cold lassitude oozes thick while autumn leaves tessellate the ground and tanagers eclipse the trees with heartbeat after frantic heartbeat. The little pins lost in the body cinch closer to the core. 
Her blood pumps its frenzy out of sheer boredom because that is what gods do. They ease into the body with flaming tongues and lips and blush their bluster, their glory into the pure and glistening gutter. Out of collapse comes the question, or rather the story about the body, which is the story about the next chapter, the next glistening now of needle and the now now they singe a sheet of paper, indifferent militants saluting from the encasement glass, their attentions secret and distant, having been asleep outside the body in this place that is cold and obscene. The tricky thing about writing ekphrastics is you have to honor the work, but you have to create a new work. Um, and it's kind of part of the fun of, of writing acrostically. Um, they get darker and darker, folks. Um, <laughs> I'm okay. This is a row of skulls that have been, they, they display what's called trepanning, which is the hole right here. And, and the idea of trepanning, are you familiar with the process? You drill a hole into the skull to sort of relieve pressure in the brain. It was often described as a, a cure for madness um, and also a, a way to excise demons out of, the, out of the body. And this is, again, another photo by Rosamund Purcell. Nocturne with a stack of trepanned skulls. In this state, the human heads cast their gaze off frame. Each eye socket, a story without progress, furrows notched into one's skull like cross hatches in a game of tic-tac-toe, the center square, a void from which the mind unravels its wild ribbons to the afterlife. On the frontal plate of another skull, a hollow space at the top, this face turned slightly towards the camera as the shutter clicks. A little door opens in its orbit, and the topaz flash highlights sutures along each bone plate. Other skulls stacked pyramidal, the hollow from each trepanning visible affronts. There are rivers among the skulls, whole canyons as easy as a breath through fabric, as easy as two hands pulling curtains together or apart. Each skull's obscene hole, an empty mouth, with a story, with an after all, with a dark because. A man had been walking, then stopped and held his head, and in the heavy dark felt his mind pierced by God, as though the God fingered his eye socket, rubbed the smooth ridges of his soft tissue, the current of such a thing dropped him to his knees, and he could hear a bell peal in the distance, the bell occupying his brain in unswept corners as the hippocampus sparks its green flame, two rocks struck in the dark. The pain of his mind careening off the stones, holding the man in its hand, like the time he held a stunned bird whose heart tore itself apart as its eyes said, hate, 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 its little electric self finding its way into the man's brain. And here is a third story. Somewhere in the past, upon the holes making a desert night cooled in a slow shaved dance. The milk of aloe hammered from succulent leaves to a mortar filled with the tarred residue. The wet aloe around the wound throws what little light comes from the moon into the skull's own dynamo as spirits rise in their stuttering and celestial hungers. From the mystical hatchet comes the pierced head, but also the quiet. The shape 
of temple blocks flicker as bone breaks and the door unhinges. What pours forth are constellations, little clusters of cloud, astounded by the shock of impact. Chip after chip chewed by the axe's tooth as the gods empty themselves from the skull, creep from the tight confines of the brain, stretch their sinuous torsos as their spines pop like the slight click of latches shifting from the twist of the key as a door from this world unlocks the next. I have more stuff. <laughs> but not this darker stuff. I think we're moving on to something a little bit more lighter. Those are my ekphrastic pieces. Um, so I'm going to read three poems from this. Um, it's a book entitled Requiem for the Orchard. And um, so a little bit about what's going on in this book. This is, this is a book that I wrote on the occasion of the birth of my son. And um, while I was writing the book, I was also thinking about who I was when I was a young person. Um, thing to know is Ontario, Oregon, which is mentioned in here, is, is a place on the eastern side of Idaho, or eastern side of Oregon. And let's see, if I'm trying to orient myself. This is Idaho, am I, am I backwards? Am I backwards, this looks like Idaho, yeah? This is Oregon. Right here on this thumb right here, that's Eastern Oregon. That's where Ontario, Oregon is. It's nowhere. <laughs> it's, it's bordered by the Snake River. This is a poem entitled, In Defense of Small Towns. When I look at it, it's simple, really. I hated life there. September, once filled with animal deaths and toughened hay, and the smells of fall were boiled down beets and potatoes, or the farmhands' breeches smeared with oil and diesel as they rode into town, dusty and pissed. The radio station split time between metal and Tejano, and the only action happened on Friday nights where the high school football team gave everyone a chance at, for at forgiveness. The town left no room for novelty or change. The sheriff knew everyone's son, and despite that, we'd cruise up and down the avenues, switching between brake and gear shift. We'd fight and spit chew into big gulp cups and have our hearts broken nightly. In that town, I learned to fire a shotgun at nine and wring a chicken's neck with one hand by twirling the bird and whipping it straight like a towel. But I loved the place once. Everything was blonde and cracked, and the irrigation ditches stretched to the end of the earth. You could ride on a bicycle and see clearly the outline of every leaf, or catch on the streets each word of a neighbor's argument. Nothing could happen there, and if I willed it, the place would have me slipping over its rocks into the river with the sugar plant's steam or signing papers at a storefront army desk, buttoned up with medallions and a crew cut, eyeing the next recruits. If I've learned anything, it's that I could be anywhere, staring at a hunk of asphalt or listening to the clap of billiard balls against each other in a bar and hear my name. Indifference now, some. I shook loose, but that isn't the whole story. The fact is, I'm still in love. And when I wake up, I watch my son yawn, and my mind turns his upswept hair into corn stalks at the edge of a field. Stillness is an acre, and his body idles deep like heavy machinery. I want to take him back there to the small town of my youth and hold the book of wildflowers open for him and look. I want him to know the colors of horses, to run with a cattail in his hand and watch as its seeds fly weightless, as though nothing mattered. 
as though the little things we tell ourselves about our pasts stay there, rising slightly and just out of reach. I think I gotta cut it short, guys. I'm gonna read one more poem. Thank you all for being a wonderful audience. It's been really a great pleasure. And if you want me to read to you privately, I will. <laughs> If you buy a book. <laughs> Self-portrait with what remains. What do I remember about the orchard? I feel it mostly in my nose. My long whistling breath and night bouts of emphysema. That I had a criminal disdain for the world and for the work which was shit but gave me cash to hold my solitude with newly bought cassettes. And that I hated the safety of my town, whose one strip mall slipped by most drivers. I hated my youth and sought the silence in rows of fruit trees where I worked a good many summers. Sometimes the orchard wore insecticide and elegant yellow sashes, a bright film on spiderweb lattices. What do I remember? The quiet, mostly. Other boys arched over their own tombstones and the white salt on the brim of my ball cap. That after we reached our quotas, we'd race back to the warehouse where the landowner kept his modest livestock and we'd beat the penned up goats with switches broken from apple branches. And in defiance once, hot rotting in a tractor we backed over a box of chicks, and what remained was a single wing without a body. The thought of it still hurts me when I breathe. The wing there cropped as though the bird took off without it. The bit of blood mashed into the tread and the unsteady laugh of the other boys. What do I remember? That I'm 36, that I'm a father, and particular pitches of my infant son's squawks mean hunger or sleep. That the yellow birds stitched on his plush toy block are not ghosts, and that not everything is a metaphor. That the music on cassettes warp with age, and that there's nothing salvageable from time on that orchard except for a few words, apparitions of tanned boys painting the bases of apple trees and a paraph of a broken image at near the end where nothing is resolved. It just is. And this, this is what's left. My night coughs, slips of news clippings from the old town sent in the mail, the know-how of tractor management. Now where once resided acrimony for youth's black seed, nothing except a single wing opening and closing and opening again to catch the wind. And what remains are my son's outstretched arms wanting nothing more than to be held aloft. Thank you all.